Um, so uh, I'll talk about Subhash Code's work now. And uh, I'll start by uh, recapping some of the jargon from the citation, which citations invariably do. He defined the unique games problem between PN and being complete and conjecture it is hard. Showed how this leads to precise acquisition of approximation ratios, achievable for various and complete problem, and also proved some unconditional new results in a variety of areas. So this was a jargon, and uh, I've uh, highlighted in red some of the things I need to explain, which I'll do in the next 10 minutes or so, and then I'll tell you about his work. Okay, so uh, I'll start by reminding you about uh, this area of computational complexity, uh, where our goal is to characterize the computation time needed to solve a computational problem. And what does it mean to characterize? Well, ideally, we should design an algorithm that runs in some time t, which is a, a time bound we are interested in. And then, having designed such an algorithm, show that no other algorithm runs in uh, that solves a problem runs in time much less than t. So if we can do that, we have characterized the computational complexity of the problem. Now, uh, the human brain seems to be pretty good at designing algorithms, uh, and uh, part A has been quite successful for a variety of problems. Somehow, we seem to be missing something, uh, and we are, we've found it very difficult to prove part B. Um, somehow, proving lower bounds on the amount of time required to solve a problem is just seems to be beyond our current capabilities. And so since there's been very little progress on B, we try to prove B modulo some conjectures, which are called complexity theory com conjectures. And this is where we've been very successful. And uh, today's work uh, that I'll talk about, about uh, will also be in this vein. And what are these famous conjectures? Well, one I think most of you must have heard about, P versus NP. So a quick recap of what P and NP are. So P is a class of problems, informally speaking, where the solution can be found in polynomial time. That, that's time that runs as n to the c, c is a fixed constant, and is the input size. And P is a uh, set of problems where a good solution can be checked in polynomial time. So we think of polynomial time as efficient, and uh, so here it's efficient to check a good solution, if somebody gives you a solution. Uh, informally, you can think of this as the difference between coming up with a mathematical proof, because once you have a proof, you can check it easily, and actually uh, verifying a proof. So NP corresponds to verifying the proof. NP complete uh, is a set of problems where uh, every, pro every uh, and a problem set with NP complete if every NP problem reduces to an instance of this problem in polynomial time. So there's thousands of problems known at this point uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, famous ones are traveling salesman, max cut, Boolean satisfiability, integer programming, etc. So one consequence of this definition is that NP-complete problems themselves reduce to each other, which is also very surprising that all these thousands of different problems reduce to one another. If you can solve one, you can solve the other. The other consequence is that uh, oh, and the P versus NP question asks that, uh, asks uh, in intuitively whether or not brilliance or creativity can be automated. Because brilliance we think of as the ability, like, like the Fields medalist today, the ability to come up with very interesting proofs, and checking the proof is considered a lower order activity, which is much easier. So if P equals NP, then brilliance or creativity can be automated. And that can be made more precise, actually. What I said about mathematical proofs, if P equals NP, then you can actually find formal mathematical proofs in time that's polynomial in the length of the proof. In other words, polynomial in the time needed to read the proof. So that's a P versus NP question. And uh, if P not equals NP, which is what most people believe, then it follows that NP complete problems cannot be solved in polynomial time. Because every NP problem can be reduced to an NP complete problem. So if an NP complete problem could be solved in polynomial time, then P would be equal to NP. So this is an example of what I said earlier that we try to prove B uh, in the previous slide, modular conjecture. So here, the conjecture P naught equals NP implies that every NP complete problem cannot be solved in polynomial time. So here's an example of an NP complete problem. That'll be a running example. 
throughout this talk, max cut. So you're given a graph, so vertices and edges, and your goal is to partition the vertices into two sets so that you maximize the number of cut edges, the edges that go from one side to the other. So in this case, the max cut is the, those, uh, consists of those two parts, and it maximizes the number of edges going from one part to the other. So this is an NP-complete problem. It was proven to be NP-complete very early on in the 70s. And formally, the NP-complete problem is not the optimization problem that I stated, but the decision version. Given uh, a graph G and K, the, uh, a graph G and a number K, does G have a cut with at least K edges? Formally, that's the NP-complete problem. But in this talk, I'll blur the, the difference between decision versions and optimization versions. So the question is, what is, you know, gi given that it's hard to actually find the optimum cut, what is the complexity of finding an approximately optimal cut? So a cut which doesn't quite maximize the number of cut edges, but approximately optimizes that. So such questions are of great practical and mathematical interest. Practical, obviously, because thousands of problems in all these variety of domains are NP-complete, so if you can compute very good approximate solutions to them, that's of great practical interest. It's also of great mathematical interest. Uh, a lot of mathematics is about exact characterizations. You saw this also in the, uh, in the last two hours. Uh, a lot of the interesting mathematics is about exact characterizations. And uh, in order to design approximation, uh, approximate solutions, you inherently seem to need a different kind of mathematics involving approximate characterizations. So this question of approximation has been uh, of great interest, as I said. And what we've discovered is that even though these NP-complete problems are equivalent with respect to actual optimization, when it comes to approximation, they seem to be quite different from each other. So approximability seems prob problem dependent. So the first example is a traveling salesman problem uh, where you are given a set of cities and you want a, a salesman tour that visits them all and has a minimum uh, total length. So for this problem, there's an old algorithm from the 70s by Christophides which comes within 50% of the optimum. So it computes a tour of cost 1.5 times the optimum. So we say that the approximation ratio of this algorithm by Christophides is 1.5. Okay, that's the definition of approximation ratio. For another problem called vertex cover, uh, there's a folklore algorithm, again, going back 40, 50 years, which can find a cover of size two times optimum. And I could go on. There are all kinds of algorithms, uh, hundreds of such approximation algorithms that have been discovered. And there's been tremendous effort in the last 25 years to design approximation algorithms. Notice that it's very counterintuitive that they are approximation algorithms because we don't know what the optimum cost is. And nevertheless, you can design an algorithm that comes within 1.5 of the optimum. Okay, so it's a very counterintuitive notion when you first encounter it. And, and it uses these uh, uh, approximate characterizations of, optim of, optim of optimality. Okay, so given that there are all these approximation algorithms and they achieve different kinds of approximation ratios for different problems, uh, the natural question is, are there limits to how well we can approximate? So for instance, this Christophides algorithm has now been around for almost four decades. Uh, can we do any better? Or are there limits to how well we can do in polynomial time? And here again, there's been great progress in the last 25 years. So before that, there was almost no progress, but then the last 25 years, there's been a lot of progress. Again, modular conjectures. And Coates' work is going to fit in that context. <coughs> to, to explain this progress, let me continue to use max cut. So there's a famous algorithm by Goins and Williamson which finds a cut where the number of edges in the cut is at least 0.878 times the max cut. So notice that it's a maximization problem, so of course no cut has more than that edges, but you can find a cut which, is, which, which has 0.878 times the optimum number of edges. This is a beautiful algorithm 
And this 0.878 seems to come from a, a geometric argument. And it's really bizarre when you first see it. I remember seeing it in grad school when it came out. And everybody around me was saying, come on, this can't be the right way to approximate cuts. You know, it's some geometric algorithm, and this 0.878 is some constant that comes out of a geometric calculation. Actually, it was I mean, the actual constant comes out of a mathematical calculation. <coughs> so, so that's an example of an algorithm. Uh, I won't describe how, it, how it's done, but it's some geometric algorithm. And then, uh, in, in an effort to understand are uh, the limits to how well you can approximate max cut? People prove the sequence of results. It was a PCP theorem I was involved in in the early 90s and culminated in what's called the Hassad PCP theorem, uh, which implies that achieving an approximation ratio of 0.95 is not going to be possible if P is not equal to NP. So if, if, you can, uh, if you can design an algorithm that comes within 0.95 of the optimum in polynomial times, then P equals NP. Okay, in, in other words, this result is saying as all PCP theorems say that approximation is no easier than exact computation, than optimum computation. So this was already a tremendous achievement uh, over, over uh, a few years. And, uh, and this is where we were stuck. So these uh, techniques involving probabilistic or checkable proofs seem to get stuck at this natural place. Okay, so this is called an inapproximability result because it's showing limits on approximation, assuming a complexity conjecture. And then a result of Koth, Kindler, Mosel, and O'Donnell using a very uh, related result of Mosel, O'Donnell, Oleskovich showed that actually achieving approximation ratio 0.878 plus epsilon for any epsilon. So just a little bit better than the gomans williamson algorithm implies that the so-called unique games conjecture of Koth is false. Okay, so this result captures uh, some of contrib uh, Koth's contributions. So Koth uh, introduces unique games conjecture and showed its usefulness. And this paper shows for the max cut problem that that conjecture implies that you cannot do better than 0.87, this algorithm. This is just a phenomenal result because it also explains in a very novel way where that 0.878 came from, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. But it, it was uh, phenomenal because, as I said, when, we, when all of us saw that geometric algorithm from Max, we said, come on, this has got to be a crazy way to do cut algorithms. Uh, and, but this, this shows that uh, going beyond that 0.878 uh, involves crossing some very tremendous hurdles. Okay, so uh, this unique games conjecture, what is that? So it's uh, something uh, I'll describe now. All right, so that's, uh, this kind of result is called a threshold result because it shows that the current algorithm is the best. So we know that there's an algorithm uh, which achieves a certain approximation ratio, and this result says that doing any better is NP complete. Okay, so there's a threshold of approximability. A priori, you, it need not be the case that there's a threshold of approximability, that maybe in polynomial time you can achieve some approximation, and then you increase the time more and more from polynomial to exponential, and you can keep getting better and better approximations. That's a priori true, and it, may, it, it probably is true for several problems, but for this problem, there's a threshold, a sharp threshold. All right, so story in a nutshell, before I dive into a little bit more detail, again, recapping, that there are interesting approximation algorithms for many NP-complete problems. That's a vast literature. There's also a vast literature on inapproximability results, uh, the so-called PCP theorems. Um, and then the work of Koth and others post-2002, after Koth introduced this methodology, uh, results in, for a significant group of problems, this threshold of approximability being determined, assuming the unique Gibbs conjecture. Okay, uh, one interesting thing. So this, I said determined. Now, determined means that I can write out the constant for you, like I did for the max cut 0.878. Well, it turns out that's not quite true. So it's determined in the following sense, that we have an algorithm, and we don't know how well that algorithm does, actually. You know, we have some idea, but we don't know precisely. And then that algorithm is optimal. That can be shown. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. I'll, I'll say more about it now. Okay, so <clears throat> what is this unique games problem? It's deceptively simple. 
And you would wonder why you never saw something like this before. So given a set of linear equations modulo prime, the prime is not so important, the, what the prime is, it's just sufficiently large. And you're trying to find a solution to the variables that satisfies the maximum number of equations. Okay, so in, in high school we learn how to solve systems of linear equations. So of course if you want to solve the system, you can do Gaussian elimination. But here the system is infeasible and you're trying to find the largest feasible subsystem. Now there's a simple reason why your high school teacher didn't teach you this, uh, th even tell you about this problem, because it's NP-complete. Okay, this, uh, this becomes a combinatorial problem. But Coates' unigame problem is a very simple case, seemingly simple case of this, where each equation has a simple form, difference of two variables and the right-hand side is a constant. Uh, why is it called unique game? Well, uh, the original definition was different and there was something which you would call a game there. And so I won't describe that, but the uniqueness refers to the fact that in such an equation, if it's actually satisfied, then for each value of xi, there's a unique value of xj. That satisfies the equation. So that's what uniqueness refers to. Uh, the game uh, aspect, yeah, you can forget about it. Uh, subsequent work has shown that this form of the uh, problem is uh, sufficiently general. So unique games conjecture uh, from this paper of, uh, as I said, it's an updated version, the original version was different, is that given an instance in which say 0.99, this 0.99 is just any constant arbitrarily close to one, fraction of equations are satisfiable, it is NP hard to satisfy more than 0.01 version, uh, more than 0.01 fraction. Okay, so uh, it's saying that even if the system is almost satisfiable, you can uh, simultaneously satisfy almost all the equations, it's still NP hard to satisfy even a small fraction, okay? So actually finding that solution is very difficult. Now as I said, this is known for more complicated systems of equations, you know, involving three variables per equation, but this form is open and code conjectured in two point, 2002 that it's NP hard. It was a very serendipitous and very insightful conjecture because it seems to balance between easiness and hardness. And uh, uh, over the years, over the last 12 years, more and more implications of this have been found and I'll describe some of those. All right, so turns out that the unique games conjecture implies that the standard approximation algorithms, these geometric algorithms based on linear programming or semi-definite programming, these are, there's a standard technique for designing approximation algorithms. These algorithms are optimal for a variety of problems. Okay, I won't read this list, but you can see there's a lot of problems here. And, and these were all well studied problems uh, in the field. And uh, not only does it imply that, but it implies that in a very, very surprising way. So it turns out that in many of these cases, the failure of the standard approximation algorithm, you know, when you find an instance on which it doesn't approximate very well, that failure and that instance is used or converted into an inapproximability result. Okay, and I'll show an example of this in a couple minutes. But let me just uh, emphasize what I just said here again. So this is just a cartoon of a man with a dunce cap and he's saying told ya. So let me explain what I mean there. So when you're a complexity theorist and especially if you've written a, a, the graduate text on it, you have, the, uh, you have the circumstance of receiving a lot of letters or emails uh, sh claiming P equals NP or the converse. And, uh, and often these are, of course, written by amateurs. And the simplest kind of email that I get is, you know, somebody's claiming P is not equal to NP. And the proof basically boils down to the following. The obvious algorithm doesn't work, right? You have to enumerate all possible solutions and that takes exponential time, right? So ob this is clearly the, ob the solution you have, the, this is clearly the algorithm you have to use because of course you have to go through all possible solutions, right? To, to see that they don't work and therefore P is not equal to NP, okay? This is the dunce's proof of P not equals NP or the amateur's proof. Okay, so it's, uh, it's uh, naive because it's saying that the obvious algorithm I thought of, that didn't work, therefore nobody's algorithm would work, right? And that's clearly not correct. 
But this unique games conjecture work actually makes that precise in a very surprising way. As I said, you take the standard algorithm using SDP or LP, okay? I'm not describing that, but you can imagine there's some geometric algorithm. And that particular algorithm, if it fails for any single instance, you can use that instance in a reduction, that, that's the bread and butter of complexity reductions, and you use that in a reduction and show that no other algorithm will achieve better than that factor, okay? So I'll describe that in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to emphasize what a surprising statement this is, okay? That the failure of an algorithm in a single instance is used to prove this general intractability result. Okay, so uh, uh, as a citation mentioned, efforts to apply, prove, or disprove UGC, so all of these have been done, and I plead guilty to have tried to do all of these as well, uh, have also yielded a treasure trove of new unconditional results, which often don't use, uh, don't even uh, mention the unique games conjecture. Uh, in that sense, they're unconditional. In analysis of Boolean functions, harmonic analysis, isoparametry, invariance principles, et cetera, high dimensional geometry, embeddability of metric spaces into each other. So I'll describe a few of those. Okay, so analysis of Boolean functions. This is an area that's been very important in this whole area, uh, starting with Hassad's work on the PCP theorem. And I'll quickly describe what it does. So uh, Boolean function as in functions whose value is zero and one, Boolean. So uh, I'll describe it with this uh, setting where it was actually discovered from social choice theory. So you have n voters and the ith one is voting xi, which is Boolean, zero, one. It's voting for Democrat or Republican or whatever. And uh, there's a voting scheme which combines these votes and generates a single decision, binary decision, uh, F. And this, in social choice theory, people study the properties of different voting schemes. And so I'll think of this voting scheme as labeling a hypercube. So this space zero, one to the n by a bit, okay? So that I'll draw it conceptually like this hypercube. And uh, the collective decision is F of x1 through xn. So that's the uh, setting. And in social choice theory, you try to understand the properties of different voting schemes and their advantages and disadvantages. And here we'll, we'll be interested in noise stability. So noise stability sub rho is the probability that this decision doesn't change if a random subset of rho fraction of voters flip their votes. So this is noise stability. And for a dictatorship, the simplest uh, voting scheme where there's one dictator in the country whose vote determines the outcome, namely xi, well, this is one minus, F, uh, one minus rho, because if you pick a random subset, the probability of the dictator is in that subset is rho. So the probability doesn't change is one minus rho. And uh, the question that came out of the study of unique games and approximability was, what is the stabilized function that is not close to a dictatorship? Okay, I won't make that precise, but what's not close and so on. And, uh, but this was an uh, intuitive statement, and the answer is uh, majority, okay? And this was this paper of Mosul with Donald Leskevich, which I mentioned earlier. So this was conjectured that majority is a stabilist function by the KKMO paper, and it was proven by, by this other paper using invariance principles and isoparametry. So you can imagine that uh, you need some tools because you're, you're trying to show that this function is extremal in a large set of functions. Okay, so using this, uh, you can actually prove the result I mentioned earlier, that 0.878 plus epsilon approximation of max cut implies that the unique games conjecture is false. Namely, you get a polynomial time algorithm for unique games. So here you see an example of what I said earlier, the, the magic of complexity, computational complexity, that you can transform very different looking problems into one another. And here we'll transform unique games into max cut so the idea is to do a reduction. You start with an, any instance of a unique games problem, and we are going to convert it into an instance of max cut, namely a graph. And the idea is that you replace each variable by a 17-dimensional hypercube, where 17 is this modulus, the, the prime uh, with respect to which you're considering the equations. And uh, okay, this is sped through uh, description. I don't expect you to understand the details, but if the constraint is something like x minus y equals 11 mod 17, then you uh, connect two points of the, of the two hypercubes for x and y, 
if the corresponding points make a certain angle. Now, this making a certain angle for two different binary vectors just corresponds to the fraction of coordinates in which they differ. So that's like the noise operator. Okay, so the, 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 y is a noisy version of x. And the amount of noise is a very precise number, uh, theta sub gw, which I'll say in a second where it comes from. And the point is that you can show that if majority stabilist, the, the theorem from the last slide, and some other additional harmonic analysis, you can show that approximately optimum cuts in this new graph uh, can be decoded to a good solution for the unique game systems. And this 0.878 corresponds to the noise stability of majority. And, and, this, is an, uh, and this is where this, uh, and I want to explain this theta sub GW, this special constant in here. This is an example of what I said earlier, the Dunces proof, right? That if the algorithm fails for one instance, then you can convert it into an in approximability result. Well, this theta, this instance, you know, these hypercubes and this angle theta G, GW and so on, this is exactly the hard instance for the Gomez Williamson algorithm. So we knew that the Gomez Williamson algorithm has bad instances where it does 0.878. This is one family of such instances, and you can use that to construct, to, to do this reduction. Okay, so this is an example of how in this area you can convert the failure of an algorithm on a single instance to this uh, result which says that all algorithms won't work. Okay, so you see that. Uh, from the last line, it's following that if you had a good algorithm for, uh, for max cut, then you would have a good algorithm for finding approximately optimal cuts, and then you'd be able to convert those approximately optimal cuts to a good solution for the UG. Okay, so this is the general methodology in all these uh, results, and it started with this paper of 2002 by Coates, where he formulated this uh, hypothesis and this methodology, and, and since then there's been this flurry of work, including by Koth himself. All right, the other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, that, that the citation also mentioned was um, the study of low dimension, uh, low, sorry, low distortion embeddings of metric spaces, and uh, this is again an important area in algorithm design which asks the following question. How similar are two metric spaces, x, d1, so x is a set of points, d1 is a metric, and y, d2? Clearly this is a basic question in analysis, uh, like how different are L1 and L2. But uh, it's also important in algorithm design because sometimes it happens that we have algorithms for one metric space which we want to generalize to other metric spaces. Okay, so it's an important question. Now, uh, one way to formulate how similar two metric spaces are to consider the distortion of mapping one into the other. So the distortion of a mapping from X to Y is the smallest constant C such that the distances in X correspond up to a factor C to distances in Y, okay, under this mapping. Okay, there's a scaling factor involved too, which I'm omitting for, uh, for clarity. So the seminal result in this area was a paper of Bourguin in 85, which showed that every endpoint metric space is an embedding into L2 with distortion log n. Okay, L2 is in some sense the simplest uh, metric space you can think of, and even every end, endpoint metric space is an embedding into L2 with distortion log n. So there's been many algorithmic implications of this kind of work, uh, and it's a big area. So I want to focus on one uh, conjecture which Coates disproved, which is the Gomez linear conjecture, which is a very important conjecture in this area that every finite metric space of negative type embeds into L1 with constant distortion. So it's the same as L1 up to a constant distortion. And uh, negative type means that it's Euclidean and the uh, squared distances satisfy triangle equality. Uh, that won't play any role in what I'll say next. Okay, so turns out that if this conjecture were true, it would yield a constant approximation for many graph partitioning problems, which is a central problem in, uh, in combinatorial algorithms for graphs. All right, so uh, most of us believed in this conjecture or something like it, it should be true, but Koth and Vishnoi showed that it's actually false, the distortion is more than log log n, and then Chior, Kleiner, and Naor have improved it to log n to epsilon. So it's known that square root log n is an upper bound. So uh, this is almost optimal. And uh, how does this connect to unique games? Well, Koth and Vishnoi used insights from unique game instances that had arisen in these hardness results and cleverly constructed negative type metric with this property. And, and their proof that it doesn't embed is also a tour de force, and it's been greatly generalized by Koth and Naur to apply to other 
metric embedding problem. So this was a very seminal result in this field. Uh, here's another unconditional result involving forms and parallel repetition and unique games. So this is a, co a completely geometric question. So what is the smallest surface area of a shape uh, lambda in d-dimensional real space such that lambda plus integer uh, translations tile the entire space? So this is a form problem which was posed by Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, uh, in the 19th century for d equals 3. So this was completely open. We knew that the unit cube, since the unit cube tiles the space, we know that the surface area of unit cube, namely 2D, is an upper bound. And the unit sphere uh, surface area must be a lower bound. Of course, it doesn't tile, but still, every body of unit uh, uh, volume must have at least the surface area of a unit sphere, so the square root D is a lower bound. And we didn't know anything beyond that. And uh, Kinlow, Donald, Rao, and Wigderson showed a form construction with area square root D and uh, also gave the best construction for d equals 3. So a centuries-old problem. And uh, this uh, construction was inspired, again, by, a, by a unique games. So it was inspired by a counterexample of Ra's to a well-studied approach for proving the unique games conjecture. So he showed that this approach doesn't work. And then from that, uh, that example, the insight was, uh, was uh, obtained. So uh, OK, so uh, there are other results of code. Uh, which I won't mention, uh, oh, but I'll just uh, put on the slide here. Um, uh, there are results having to do with semi definite programs and showing that unique games from Mazizi when constraint graph is random or random like. Um, he also has other contributions that don't use the unique games conjecture. So there's in approximability results that don't rely on the unique games conjecture, like, for instance, for the shortest vector and integer lattice. So geometry of numbers was mentioned. This is a central problem in there, and he showed the in approximability of that. Um, he also has the best progress today on proving unique games conjecture um, uh, you, with Moshkowitz. OK, so in conclusion, Code's 2002 definition of unique games problem and unique games conjecture proved very prescient. And uh, subsequent work, including his significant contributions, led to an exciting decade of new discoveries in theoretical CS uh, with more to come. So this was all very anticipated, unanticipated. It was very surprising. Uh, I was his dissertation advisor, and originally when he told me the Unigames conjecture, I was not so impressed. Uh, but he uh, pushed on with it and, and came up with really beautiful insights uh, and, and also motivated others to work on it. And so congratulations, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. It's time now to start the lecture by uh, uh, Nevanina, Nevanina Prize winner Subash Kot. Uh, this time, the role of the chair is easy because uh, the prize winner and his work have been introduced at the opening ceremony and at the laudation just uh, before this talk. So all I have to do is to announce that the next speaker is Supash Kot, speaking about hardness of approximation. Uh, thanks, Lassi. Uh, and I sincerely thank uh, the International Mathematical Union uh, for this award. And many thanks to Sanjeev for his uh, nice introduction to this research topic. So my top talk will be uh, expanded version of Sanjeev's talk with more details. Uh, and some directions for future research. Uh, so we'll start by looking at two NP-complete problems. The first problem is the traveling salesperson problem, where we are given a set of cities, pairwise distances between the cities in a two-dimensional plane, and the goal is to find a tour that visits all these cities, and uh, the distance uh, traveled is minimized. The second problem is the maximum clique problem, where we are given a graph, and the goal is to find a clique of maximum size. A clique is a subset of vertices, uh, which are all pairwise connected by edges. Uh, and these are NP-complete problems, meaning if P is not equal to NP, which we strongly believe, and we will more or less take it for granted for this talk, then there is no fast algorithm to compute optimal solutions to these problems where an algorithm is considered fast if it runs in time polynomial in the size of the input. Uh, for example, for the clique problem, the size of the input would be the number of vertices in the graph. Now, since uh, we don't hope to find 
optimal solutions fast? Can we compute approximate solutions fast? And this is clearly relevant from the viewpoint of optimization, but turns out also uh, from uh, viewpoint of machine learning, cryptography also has connections uh, to uh, combinatorics, probability, analysis, geometry, uh, and so on. So that's the question. How well can we approximate NP-complete problems? Now, for these two specific problems, the answer is more or less known. Uh, for traveling salesperson, uh, Aurora and Mitchell showed that in polynomial time, we can compute a tour which is uh, within 1% of the length of the minimum tour. And in fact, up to any arbitrarily small uh, constant degree of accuracy. On the other hand, for the click problem, Hastad showed that we cannot hope to approximate it at all. Uh, so he showed that if P is not equal to NP, then if I give you a graph, uh, I tell you that there is a clique of very, very large size, then in polynomial time, uh, you won't even be able to uh, find a clique of size significantly larger than one. And of course, you can always output one vertex as clique, and that's a clique of size one. Uh, however, this question of how well we can approximate different problems, this is largely open. And the unique games conjecture uh, was proposed towards uh, making progress, and specifically towards showing optimal hardness results. Uh, so hardness of approximation result is a result showing that for a given problem, even computing approximate solutions is hard or computationally infeasible. So results such as uh, Hastad's result that I mentioned. So I will state the unique games conjecture, though uh, we won't really uh, use the statement as such in the rest of the talk. Uh, so we are given system of linear equations modulo a prime, such as shown uh, in the picture. We have set of variables, uh, uh, set of equations. Each equation is of the form uh, a variable x sub i minus a variable x sub j equals a value c sub i j uh, mod p. And the goal is to find assignment to the variables so as to satisfy uh, maximum or uh, approximately maximum number of uh, equations. Uh, so this problem is a special case of uh, unique game problem. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the name unique game, uh, this is for historical reasons. Uh, these were studied in a related context earlier, in particular by uh, Feige and Loash. And here is statement of the unique games conjecture. Uh, this is a bit different from the original statement, but now we know that it's equivalent to the original statement. So this states that uh, fix any arbitrarily small constant delta, then if the prime p is large enough, uh, then uh, if you have a system of linear equations like this, uh, which is one minus delta satisfiable, meaning there is an assignment which satisfies almost all the equations, then in polynomial time, we cannot find an assignment which is even delta satisfying, meaning one that satisfies even small delta fraction of the equations. Uh, so that's the uh, conjecture. Uh, and the important point is that uh, these equations are linear. If you allow equations of arbitrary large degree, uh, but still, each equation depending on two variables, uh, then such a result is already known, and it's also very useful. Uh, and the main uh, implication of the unique games conjecture is that if you believe that this problem, which is the uni unique game problem, uh, right, which is uh, finding uh, approximate uh, solutions to these system of linear equations, if this is hard, then many, many other problems are hard as well. In particular, we will focus on this maximum cut problem uh, in this talk. So here is overview for the rest of the talk. We'll define maximum cut problem. I will state the two most basic results on this topic, uh, one called the PCP theorem, and one uh, which is the gomans williamsons algorithm. And then I will explain connections to uh, probability, analysis, and geometry, and how everything uh, fits together. Uh, and finally, a couple of open questions towards resolving the unique games conjecture. So the maximum cut problem, this will be used as a running illustrative example throughout the talk. So we are given a graph. The goal is to find a cut in this graph so as to cut as many uh, edges as possible. A cut is simply partition of the vertices into two disjoints. For example, here is one possible cut. Uh, but this is not a very good cut. Uh, if our goal is to cut as many edges as possible. And a much better cut is uh, this where I view a cut as coloring of the vertices with two colors, red and green. And for visual purposes, now if you rearrange the graph mentally, then this is how the graph looks like. It's almost bipartite, meaning almost all the edges go from the red side to the green side. Okay. Uh, and of course, there are few edges uh, either on the red side or uh, on the green side. So the graph is almost bipartite. 
And this is the special case of the problem uh, we will focus on uh, in this talk. That I give you a graph, I guarantee that uh, it's nearly bipartite, meaning there is a cut uh, that cuts uh, one minus epsilon fraction of the edges. Okay? And then the goal is to actually find a, a good cut uh, in polynomial time. Okay? So that's the problem. Uh, so what can we do? This problem is NP-complete, so uh, we do not hope to actually find the cutoff maximum size, which is 1 minus epsilon, relative to the total number of edges. Uh, it's trivial to find a cut that cuts half of the edges. Just randomly partition the set of vertices into two sets, uniformly at random, so you will cut half of the edges uh, in expectation. And if you want a deterministic algorithm, you can easily find a deterministic algorithm uh, that cuts uh, half of the edges. Now, till early 90s, uh, this was all we knew. Uh, uh, and in early 90s, there were two breakthrough results, uh, one from the algorithmic side and one from the uh, hardness side, meaning uh, researchers were able to design an algorithm which is much better than this trivial algorithm. On the other hand, researchers were also able to show that uh, not only that it's hard to find cut of the maximum size, it's also hard to find a cut of uh, near maximum size. So let me state the hardness result first. Uh, so this states that if P is not equal to NP, then no polynomial time algorithm can find a cutoff size one minus beta times epsilon uh, for some uh, absolute fixed constant beta that is strictly larger than one. Okay, so that's the uh, hardness result. And this is called the PCP theorem. Uh, the acronym PCP stands for probabilistic uh, checking of proofs. Uh, and this is uh, uh, because uh, there is an, another equivalent uh, viewpoint uh, to state this theorem. And from that viewpoint, uh, the statement is that uh, mathematical proofs, uh, they can be rewritten so that the correctness of these rewritten proofs can be checked very efficiently by a probabilistic checker. A checker that uh, actually needs to look only at a constant number of bits uh, in the proof. And the checker works with uh, extremely high confidence. Uh, and this is actually, this is the viewpoint uh, via which the theorem was discovered, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, I will take the hardness of approximation point of view. And from the hardness point of view, this is the, this is the PCP theorem. Okay, that it's hard to find cuts of size one minus beta times epsilon. On the other hand, Gomans Williamson, they designed an algorithm uh, which finds a cut of size one minus square root of epsilon. Okay. Uh, and uh, so uh, just to refer to Sanjeev's talk, this one minus square root epsilon, it's an approximation. There is a precise trigonometric number there. And then, uh, yeah, once you fiddle around with it, you get the point 0.878 uh, that Sanjeev was talking about. If you only care about the multiplicative ratio between uh, the maximum possible cut and the cut that you actually find, okay? So this, is, this setting is slightly different from Sanjeev's, uh, uh, what Sanjeev talked about. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is what the Gomans Williamson's uh, algorithm gives. Uh, and we want to think of epsilon as a small constant. Uh, so there is still a gap between 1 minus beta times epsilon and 1 minus square root of epsilon in terms of what we cannot do and what we can do in polynomial time. Uh, and uh, bridging this gap or understanding uh, uh, this gap uh, 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 turns out to be a rather fruitful uh, pursuit. Uh, so let me quickly describe a high level view of this algorithm. So this algorithm uh, takes the input graph, embeds the graph onto a unit high dimensional sphere, meaning you map the vertices onto points of the uh, a unit high dimensional sphere. Uh, this is via a technique known as semi-definite programming relaxation. So I won't describe this. Uh, and once you have this embedding, uh, and the embedding uh, uh, has this important property, that if there are two vertices which are connected uh, by an edge in the graph, then the two corresponding points on the sphere, uh, typically, they are nearly antipodal to each other. Okay? So that's the property of this embedding. And once you have this embedding, you can slice the sphere into two parts by passing a hyperplane through the origin. And the hyperplane itself is chosen uniformly at random from the set of all hyperplanes. Uh, yeah, and once you cut the sphere into two parts, think of it as coloring the two sides with colors green uh, and red. Uh, this in turn is going to give you a coloring of the vertices of the graph. Okay, and that's, that's, that's the cut which the algorithm uh, finds. 
And as I said, uh, if the graph has a cutoff size one minus epsilon, this algorithm finds a cutoff size one minus a square root of epsilon. Now, a priori, there is no reason to believe that this is the optimal or the best algorithm. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I believe that when the algorithm was discovered first, uh, it was viewed as uh, somewhat of an unnatural algorithm. Uh, because the problem of finding cuts in graphs is very combinatorial, and this algorithm seems to be some roundabout geometric uh, way of going about it. Uh, but turns out that if you are willing to assume the unique games conjecture, this algorithm is indeed optimal. Uh, and this implication itself is uh, uh, non-trivial. And it involves uh, uh, analysis of Boolean functions, isoperimetric problems uh, in Gaussian space, uh, and invariance principles uh, in probability. Right? So that's the implication, that the unique games conjecture implies optimality of this algorithm. Uh, so here is a formal statement uh, that the unique games conjecture implies that uh, uh, no polynomial time algorithm uh, given a graph that has a cut of size one minus epsilon can actually produce a cut of size uh, one minus uh, half times square root epsilon. Uh, that half is just for the sake of concreteness. So uh, anything which is uh, better than one minus square root of epsilon. Okay, so that's the formal uh, statement of the theorem. And such a statement is proved by uh, reductions, which is a very standard tool in computational complexity. And why are these reductions? Uh, turns out that, that these pro uh, connections to probability analysis and geometry, uh, they come into play. So I will uh, talk about these in the next uh, few slides. Okay. Uh, so what is a reduction? Uh, so in this case, we want a reduction from the unique game problem to the maximum cut problem. So reduction amounts to taking an instance of the first problem, right? Here it's simply a system of linear equation like this. And then from this instance, you construct an instance of the second problem, right? So here uh, it's a graph, okay? uh, right? And it's an explicit construction. Uh, 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 it, and it runs in polynomial time. And this reduction is correct in the sense that now finding cuts uh, in the graph actually amounts to uh, finding uh, good solutions to this linear system. Okay? And now the unique games conjecture states that uh, finding good solutions to the linear system uh, is a hard problem. And therefore, finding large cuts in the graph must be a hard problem as well. Okay? So that's how a reduction works. And here are two uh, concrete properties uh, which ensure that the reduction works or the reduction is correct. Okay? So the first property states that if the system is nearly satisfiable, so let's say uh, there is a solution satisfying 99% of the equations, then the graph has a large cut, cut of size one minus epsilon. On the other hand, if the system uh, does not even have solution which is 1% satisfying, then the graph does not have large cut. So no cut of size even one minus half times square root epsilon. Okay, and now the unique games conjecture states that given a system which is 99% satisfiable, uh, in polynomial time, we cannot find a solution which is 1% satisfying. And this in turn implies that given a graph which has a cut of size one minus epsilon, in polynomial time, we cannot hope to find a cut of size one minus half times square root epsilon. Okay, so, that's, uh, so this is what the reduction is. Uh, and this, at a high level, uh, this scheme was developed by researchers in mid-90s and applied successfully to some specific uh, uh, problems, uh, such as the clique problem that I mentioned right in the beginning. So I'm not going to uh, actually describe how this reduction works, but I will uh, talk about what goes into proving that this reduction is correct. Uh, and one of the ingredients is uh, th this theorem known as the majority is uh, stabilist theorem. It's a Fourier analytic theorem on the Boolean hypercube. So what's this theorem? Uh, so at least from the picture, uh, uh, it's clear that the final graph that we construct, it uh, contains copies of the Boolean hypercube. Okay, and since we want to study cuts in the overall graph, uh, at the very least, we have to study cuts on the Boolean hypercube graph, right? So what is a Boolean hypercube? Uh, it's an n-dimensional Boolean hypercube, has set of vertices as plus minus one to the n, and two vertices are connected if these are two bit strings which differ in exactly one bit. Okay, so that's the Boolean hypercube graph. Uh, and what is a cut? Cut is simply partition of the vertices into two sets, right? Which is same as labeling the vertices by either plus one or minus one. And therefore, a cut in the Boolean hypercube, it's same as a Boolean function f, right? It's a function which maps the Boolean hypercube to either plus or minus one. Okay, so we, we want to study functions like this. 
Um, and in turn, any such function can be viewed as uh, a voting scheme or as if it's defining rule of an election uh, in the following manner. So suppose there is an election with two candidates labeled plus one and minus one. There are n voters and the voters, uh, they vote uniformly at random for the two candidates and independently. Okay, so that's the model. And then we have a Boolean function f, uh, which is the rule of an election, meaning once, you, once the voters have voted, you look at the sequence of n votes, it's a bit string, you apply the function on the sequence of the votes and you get the result of the election. Right? And therefore, every Boolean function, uh, it amounts to a uh, rule uh, or a voting scheme. And we want democratic voting schemes, uh, so I won't formally define this. Uh, but intuitively, a scheme is democratic if uh, no voter, no individual voter has too much influence on the outcome of the election, okay. uh, intuitively. Uh, and the number of voters is large. So in practice, we do have democratic schemes. Uh, for instance, the majority vote, where you just look at the votes and the candidate who gets more votes wins. Uh, there is an electoral uh, college uh, scheme uh, which amounts to taking uh, majority of majorities. And you can certainly uh, uh, f uh, cook up your own favorite uh, democratic voting scheme. And here is a question we are interested in. Uh, consider a scheme which is, scheme as in a Boolean function, which is democratic and also balanced, meaning the Boolean function takes the two values plus or minus one uh, equally often. And then among all such uh, uh, voting schemes, which scheme is most noise stable? In the sense that if uh, after the voters have voted, maybe some small fraction of the vote, votes, uh, they, they got corrupted or miscounted. Uh, and we would like a voting scheme uh, which is stable in the sense that uh, even under a small corruption of the votes, the chance that the uh, result of the election itself changes is small. So that's, uh, that's what a stable, uh, noise stable scheme is. Formally, if X denotes uh, a ran uniformly random sequence of votes, uh, and uh, once the vote, the sequence of votes X has been chosen, Y denotes a sequence of corrupted votes. So where the vote Y sub I equals the original vote X sub I with probability one minus epsilon, and uh, it gets flipped or corrupted with some small probability epsilon. And then we would like a function f, which minimizes the probability that uh, f of x is different from f of y, meaning it minimizes the probability that the result of the election changed. Okay. And the answer turns out to be the majority function. That's the result of uh, Mosel, O'Donnell, and Oleshkiewicz. And the tool used to prove this result is uh, the invariance principles in probability. Uh, in particular, in this context, the invariance principles allow us to uh, translate this problem about uh, functions on the Boolean hypercube, so, so problem in the Boolean domain, to a problem on, in, the, uh, in the Gaussian domain. So it's a problem about functions on the Gaussian space. Okay, so I will sketch uh, 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 how this works. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, uh, Boolean function f, which is democratic, balanced. It's well known that every such function can be viewed as a multilinear polynomial. Right? That's the hadamard walsh transform or Fourier, discrete Fourier transform over the Boolean hypercube. Right? So we have this multilinear polynomial. So here is a pictorial view. Right? We have n inputs, which are iid plus minus one Boolean inputs. Uh, you apply this polynomial and you get the output. Right? So that's the pictorial view. Now, since uh, the function is a polynomial, uh, as inputs, I can substitute arbitrary real numbers if I want to. Right? I don't necessarily have to substitute only uh, Boolean uh, plus minus one values. Okay? So the same function I can think of as a function from R to the N to R, because it's just a polynomial. In particular, uh, the inputs I will choose as uh, independent and standard Gaussians, standard mean zero variance Gaussians. Okay? And then this function becomes uh, the function on the Gaussian space. It's, it's a polynomial. And the invariance principle states that if the function is uh, democratic and balanced, then the Boolean view and the Gaussian view, they are nearly identical. Okay. So they are nearly identical. So in the following sense, uh, so the inputs are random variables, right? They are either Boolean or Gaussian. And therefore the outputs are also random variables. And the invariance principle states that the outputs viewed as random variables, uh, they are nearly uh, identical. Okay, that's, and that's the invariance principle. Uh, and this has one remarkable consequence. Uh, 
that in the Boolean case, the output is always Boolean. It's either plus or minus one. And therefore, the same holds in the Gaussian space. Now, in the Gaussian or the real uh, case, uh, the output could be arbitrary real number, right, a priori. Uh, but it just happens that the output is essentially Boolean. So it's, it's always plus or minus one up to some small errors. Okay, and if you ignore the errors, then uh, it simply amounts to partitioning the space R to the N into two parts, right? Because it's a Boolean function on this space. Uh, and turns out even the noise stability is preserved, uh, even quantitatively. Uh, so you have to define uh, appropriately the definition of noise stability in the Gaussian space. It's the same definition. It's the probability that the function changes the value under a small perturbation of the input. Uh, yeah, now uh, our original problem now amounts to uh, finding a uh, func Boolean function in the Gaussian space, uh, which is most noise stable. Okay. And this is uh, just amounts to solving the isoperimetric problem in the Gaussian space. Uh, and this was already done by Borel uh, in 85. Uh, it states that uh, the most noise stable partition of the Gaussian space into two parts with equal Gaussian volume uh, is half space through the origin. Okay. You half space through the origin, you cut the whole space into two uh, half spaces, each with volume one half. And that's the most noise stable partition. And now this you uh, uh, switch back in, uh, on, in the Boolean world and you get the result that majority is the most stable voting scheme. Okay, so this more or less uh, uh, sketches uh, how uh, this works. So to summarize, uh, we have the Borel's theorem, which is the Gaussian isoperimetric result. It implies the majority stabilist theorem via uh, invariance principle. That in turn implies that this proposed reduction from the uni games problem to the maximum cut problem is correct. Okay? And that's, uh, that's how this works. Turns out that this scheme has rather, uh, 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 yeah, rather uh, a broad generalization. Uh, and for many computational problems, say pi, uh, you can uh, come up with a geometric isoperimetric type theorem corresponding to this problem pi. And this is inspired by the problem pi, right, which is a computational problem. Uh, and this, impl this implies a Fourier analytic theorem on the discrete hypercube, again by invariance principles, which in turn implies correctness of the proposed reduction, right, to show that the problem pi is hard to approximate. Uh, and these three things, the hardness results, Fourier analytic theorems, and the isoperimetric type theorems, uh, for a large class of problems, uh, these three things are even formally equivalent. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, there are some theorems, uh, uh, either the geometric or the Fourier analytic. Uh, we, we, we may use theorems which were already known, or we might even discover new theorems uh, in this framework. Uh, in fact, this majority stabilist theorem, it was discovered precisely uh, in this manner. And there are more theorems which are predicted by this framework uh, and actually proving these geometric or Fourier analytic theorems, these, these seem uh, yeah, interesting and uh, challenging questions. Uh, so I will uh, uh, give one more context in which uh, the connections to geometry arise. And these are via uh, counter examples to proposed algorithms. So suppose we have a problem, computational problem pi, and a reduction from the unique games problem to this problem pi, okay? Uh, and therefore, the unique games conjecture implies that this problem pi, pi is hard to approximate, okay? But nevertheless, you can always propose an algorithm, a candidate algorithm, to solve the problem. Yeah, suppose, so, so, suppose we proposed an algorithm, or even a family of uh, algorithms, which is increasingly more powerful and uh, elaborate. So let's say a family of algorithms. Now the unique games conjecture predicts that the problem is hard to approximate. So these algorithms uh, will have to fail. And therefore, there must be counter examples, uh, dem explicit counter examples, demonstrating that these algorithms fail. Uh, and turns out, uh, yeah, and of course, as your algorithms became increasingly more elaborate, the corresponding counter examples, uh, they will also have to be increasingly more uh, elaborate. And turns out actually constructing such explicit counterexamples uh, is interesting and challenging task and often amounts to proving uh, geometric results. Uh, so I will just give one example. When you apply this scheme to the maximum cut problem, or more precisely, 
uh, to a related problem called uh, sparsest cut problem. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, then the unique games conjecture predicts that uh, counter examples exist, and here the counter examples, they simply amount to uh, non embeddability results for uh, finite matrix. Uh, so, uh, specifically, the unique games conjecture predicts that there are endpoint finite matrix, so call the distance function of this matrix D, such that the metric does not embed well into the class of L1 matrix, meaning there is no way to map these endpoints of the metric into uh, uh, L1 space uh, and still preserve uh, all the pairwise distances by a small factor. Okay. Moreover, if you take the square root of the metric, uh, which, uh, which is easily shown to be uh, itself a metric, then the square root of the metric embeds uh, exactly into the class of L2 matrix. Moreover, even though the metric overall does not embed into L1, each of its uh, small sized uh, subs subsets uh, does embed uh, precisely into L1. So the metric, globally speaking, uh, is very unlike L1, but locally it is like L1. Okay? And the Unigames conjecture predicts that there is such a metric with these increasingly elaborate properties. Uh, and researchers were actually able to uh, co explicitly construct such metrics. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, one can uh, define algorithms or propose algorithms which are even more elaborate, and then uh, one would predict that there are metrics with even more elaborate properties. Uh, but beyond this point, uh, constructing these metrics uh, becomes uh, 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 an open problem. Yeah. And this ties in uh, quite well with uh, uh, the first open problem. Uh, so I wanted to uh, pose two problems which are uh, at least very easy to state, and uh, hopefully the statement should be completely clear, and uh, I mean, maybe for all you know, you could even start working on it, or at least uh, start thinking about it. Uh, and it would really help uh, this uh, research area if you answer these questions. Uh, so the first one is about what are known as refutation systems. Uh, so suppose there is a computational problem pi, uh, which has an algorithm, either exact algorithm or approximate algorithm, uh, doesn't matter. And this algorithm is supposed to be correct, uh, right? It works. Uh, and suppose that on some concrete instance of the problem, uh, the algorithm did not find a solution. Uh, now, since the algorithm is correct, if it did not find a solution, it means there is no solution. Okay? So it's a proof uh, of infeasibility of a solution. Okay? And a proof of infeasibility of a solution is uh, referred to as uh, uh, refutation. Now, we can turn this uh, argument around and say that if there is no simple refutation on some concrete instance of the problem, then this is evidence that there is no uh, uh, efficient algorithm uh, to solve this problem. Okay? And our overall goal uh, all this time has been to give evidence that there is no efficient algorithm to find approximate solutions. Right? And therefore, it's worthwhile to show that uh, there is no simple refutation on some instance of the problem. Uh, and a refutation is simple with respect to some measure of uh, complexity of the refutation. In particular, uh, one can uh, study uh, refutations in uh, standardized uh, systems uh, where rules as to how you deduce successive statements in your refutation, uh, they are uh, well defined and prescribed. Uh, in particular, these rules could be defined uh, in terms of linear or semi-definite uh, programming. Uh, uh, and uh, there are at least three such uh, systems proposed, one by Loash and Scriver, one by Sherali and Adams, uh, and one by uh, Lachere. Okay. Uh, and, the, and then the goal would be uh, to show that in these systems, there is no simple refutation. Uh, and turns out that these systems, uh, there is a dual view of uh, looking at these systems as actually uh, algorithms based on linear or semi-definite programming. And in the dual view, it would simply amount to uh, coming up with counterexamples to algorithms, as I described before. But here, uh, let's take this uh, refutation view. Uh, now, for this maximum cut problem, turns out that there are very good negative results uh, for Lovash Kriver and the Sherali Adams system, uh, meaning, uh, concrete instances of graphs where uh, there is no simple refutation. Uh, however, coming up with such negative results for the Lachere system, uh, that's an open problem. Uh, and the Lachere, this is also known as sum of square system, positive Stellenzage, it has connections to the Hilbert 17th problem. Uh, 
uh, we'll refer to it as uh, sum of square system. Okay, and here is an open problem. Uh, suppose we have an n vertex graph. The size of the maximum cut is precisely 1 minus epsilon times the number of edges. Uh, now, what is a cut? It's simply labeling of the vertices by two labels, plus or minus one. Okay? And I claim that I can write down a system of polynomial inequalities which is infeasible. Okay? Uh, this is how. Uh, now, a cut is simply labeling the vertices by either plus or minus one. So, for each vertex i, I could assign a label called x sub i, which is supposed to be plus or minus one, depending on which side of the cut vertex lies. Okay? And since this label is supposed to be plus or minus one, uh, I can write down this equation that x i squared equals plus one. Okay? And then I will write down an inequality uh, which actually claims that the size of the cut is one more than the size of the maximum cut, okay? and which is clearly a false statement. And therefore, this is an infeasible system. Okay? So why is this? If you look at the right hand side of this inequality, it's one plus one minus epsilon times the number of edges, which is the size of the maximum cut. Okay? On the left hand side, it's a sum over all edges ij of the graph, the expression one minus xi xj over two. Okay? And xi is plus or minus one, dep right? depending on which side of the cut you are on. And therefore, this expression one minus xi xj over two is either one or zero, depending on whether the edge is cut or not cut. Okay, and therefore, the left hand side is simply the number of edges which is cut. Right? And the statement amounts to a claim that there is a cut which is larger than the size of the maximum cut and therefore, it is infeasible system. And we want to refute this. Uh, so, here is one way to refute uh, the infeasibility of this system. So, let us call the, uh, the top equations as p, I, p sub i equals 0, the inequality as q greater or equal to 0, where p sub i and q are uh, polynomials right? as shown in the picture. And here is uh, the so called sum of squares refutation. So, suppose I could somehow come up with polynomials r sub i, s sub j, t sub j such that the following identity holds. Okay? Uh, so, it is sum of three terms equals minus one. The first term is uh, some sort of combination of the polynomial p i's. It is summation r sub i, p sub i. The second term is the polynomial q multiplied by sum of squares of polynomials s sub j and the third term is sum of squares of polynomials t sub j. Okay? And, uh, so, that is the left hand side. Uh, now, why is this uh, contradiction? Now, the polynomial p sub i that is supposed to be identically 0. right? So, the first term which is the combination of p sub i's that really vanishes. And then what remains is non-negative because q is non-negative and then I have polynomials in the squared form. So, the entire left hand side is non negative. On the other hand, the right hand side is supposed to be minus 1 and therefore, this is a contradiction. Right? And therefore, it is a valid refutation. Now, turns out uh, such a refutation always exists. Uh, so, the question really is, is there a refutation which is simple, low complexity refutation? Um, and the complexity here uh, we will measure in terms of uh, uh, degrees of the polynomials involved. Okay? So, we would like to have a refutation with low degree meaning all the polynomials involved in that uh, equation uh, have degree at most whatever that is, right? at most degree d. Okay? So, that is our goal. Uh, right? Given a graph, uh, is there always a refutation with low degree? Now, uh, right, this was the in system of infeasible inequalities. Turns out that the answer is no. Uh, uh, there is no constant degree refutation. In fact, we know explicit graphs for which any such refutation requires degree which is linear in the number of vertices. Okay? So, this is known. Now, suppose I I uh, uh, I am interested only in refutations of constant degree, right? Uh, using only polyno polynomials with constant degree. So, what could I do? So, one thing I could do is I could start with an hypothesis which is even more false. Okay? And if I if I have a hypothesis which is even more fa false, then presumably it will become easier uh, to refute it. Okay? So, for example, I could claim that there is a cut of size much larger, uh, say 1 minus epsilon squared times the number of edges. Okay? So, this is a statement which is now much more false. Okay? And turns out that if you make the statement uh, false enough like this, uh, there is indeed a refutation uh, of degree 2, meaning using polynomials with only degree 2. And this is really just a dual view of this Gomans Williamson's algorithm that I described. And it is also illustrated this duality between the refutation view and the algorithmic view. And the open question is in the middle. What happens in the middle? 
meaning suppose I have a hypothesis which states that number of edges cut is somewhere in the middle between 1 minus epsilon times the number of edges and 1 minus epsilon squared times the number of edges. Okay, and this, uh, I mean, it's a sim seemingly simple question, uh, but uh, we are kind of uh, really stuck on this. Uh, meaning, is it always the case that, uh, uh, or uh, for every graph, there is necessarily a constant degree refutation? And the unique games conjecture actually predicts no. Uh, so clearly, I mean, settling this has some bearing on the truth of the unique games conjecture. Um, so that's the first question. Uh, so the second question relates to uh, existence of uh, certain kinds of graphs, and these are uh, predicted by a hypothesis, uh, new hypothesis called small set expansion hypothesis, uh, which implies the unique games conjecture. Okay, so let uh, let's see what this hypothesis is. This is about expansion of graphs. Uh, so we'll look at graphs where all vertices have the same degree. So let's say all vertices have degree d. Uh, we know what an expansion of a set is. Uh, expansion of a set. Uh, a set of vertices S is the number of edges leaving this set divided by the total number of edges incident on the set, which is the degree D times the number of vertices in the set, right? So it's the probability that if I pick a random vertex in this set, uh, take a random walk getting out of this vertex is the probability that I actually leave this set S, right? So that's the expansion of a set. Uh, the expansion of a graph as a, like, as an overall object. Uh, this is a parameter called phi sub G. It's the minimum expansion over all sets, all sets of size uh, between 1 and n over 2, where n is the total number of vertices. Uh, so this is an extremely important parameter of graphs, uh, graph expansion. Uh, so I won't kind of emphasize uh, that aspect. Uh, so it's known that uh, by inequalities of Chigar and Allen and Milman that uh, this parameter phi sub g of a graph uh, can be computed or approximated very well okay, in polynomial time. And this is why are computing eigenvalues of uh, normalized adjacency matrix uh, of a graph. So with the graph, you can associate an n by n matrix whose diagonal entries are zero, and the off diagonal entries, they are either one over d or zero, depending on whether an edge is present or absent. Okay, so that's uh, uh, adjacency matrix. It's well known that uh, its eigenvalues are between one and minus one. The largest eigenvalue is one, so you could write uh, the eigenvalues in decreasing order. And the important parameter is the difference between the first eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue. Okay? And the Chigar and Allen Milman inequalities, they say that the graph expansion phi sub g, it's within quadratic factor of the uh, eigenvalue gap, which is one minus lambda sub two. Okay? So you can compute eigenvalues in polynomial time, and this will give you a quadratic approximation to graph expansion in polynomial time. Okay, so this is well known. So what we want to look at is a related notion called small set expansion. Okay. So again, we have a graph, we know what expansion of a set is, uh, and small set expansion of a graph is a new parameter called phi sub g of delta. So think of delta as a small positive constant, like 0.001. Okay. And then this is a minimum expansion over all sets, but only of sets up to size delta times n. Okay, so only uh, sets of small size, but still linear in the number of total number of vertices. Okay, so it's a new parameter, which is a natural enough parameter to study. Um, and Raghavanandra and Steurer, uh, they uh, hypothesize that even though the graph expansion, phi sub g is easy to approximate, uh, this new parameter, uh, the small set expansion parameter, is actually hard to approximate, or computationally infeasible uh, to approximate. And they show that uh, if so, then this would imply the unique games conjecture. Okay. And uh, okay, and so we want to uh, study this new hypothesis. And now, as I described before, this is a hypothesis which claims that a certain computational problem is hard. Uh, now, you can always propose an algorithm and then uh, try to find count why this algorithm failed and whether there is a counterexample. And indeed, you can propose a candidate algorithm to compute this uh, small set expansion parameter. Now the hypothesis predicts that the algorithm fails and therefore counterexample exists, okay? And this amounts to the following prediction, that there are n, n vertex graphs uh, or for every positive epsilon, uh, for a small enough positive constant delta, uh, there is a family of n vertex graphs such that uh, all sets of small size expand very well. So let's say all sets of size up to delta times n uh, have excellent expansion, expansion of at least one half. On the other hand, the graph has many large eigenvalues. So recall that the largest eigenvalue is one. So the, uh, the statement is that 
the number of eigenvalues which exceeds 1 minus epsilon is polynomial in the number of vertices, is n to the delta. Okay, so that's the prediction. And then the question is uh, whether such graphs exist, which again seems like a really nice problem. Uh, there was some uh, interesting partial progress recently by Barak et al. Okay, and that's more or less it. So in conclusion, the study of uh, in approximability of NP-complete problems is interesting, challenging, many connections uh, to CS and math. Uh, the unique games conjecture is one of the approaches, uh, but there are many more problems uh, for which the unique games conjecture uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have much to offer, such as computational problems on integer lattices, traveling salesperson problem, uh, problems coming out of learning theory, and uh, many researchers, including myself, have uh, worked on proving uh, results uh, for many of these problems, uh, not depending on the Unigames conjecture, of course. And there will be two talks in this conference which are related to what I talked about, one by Boaz Barak and one by uh, Ryan O'Donnell. Finally, I will acknowledge uh, some of my mentors, colleagues, and friends. Uh, so Sanjeev Arora, Avi Vigderson, Johan Hastad, Muli Safra, Asaf Naur, and uh, my high school teacher and lifelong uh, mentor, uh, Gokte Sir. That's Thank you very much, uh, Subhash, for this uh, very interesting and uh, very uh, rich talk, uh, talk with rich content. Uh, before uh, uh, we quit, I would like uh, to say that the organizers uh, will, will uh, give a little present to uh, the speakers, and uh, this is a uh, a tablet, uh, Samsung Galaxy, and uh, so please. Samsung Galaxy, no. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Congratulations.